This is a screencast on Roman baths, an ancient leisure centre. Of all the leisure activities, bathing was surely the most important for the greatest number of Romans, since it was a part of the daily regimen for men of all classes and many women as well. For the Romans, a visit to the baths was an essential part of daily life. Few people in Roman towns had running water in their houses, and so bathing at home would have been almost impossible. In the hot climate of the Mediterranean, there would have been an even greater need to bathe than today. However, a visit to the baths would not merely have been a practical necessity, but also a social occasion, which could easily take a couple of hours or even more out of every afternoon. We think of bathing as a very private activity conducted in the home, but bathing in Rome was a communal activity, conducted for the most part, in public facilities that in some ways resembled modern spas or health clubs, although the Roman baths were far less expensive than these modern equivalents. While most people in Western Europe can expect to have water readily available in their home, this has not always been the case. In Roman times, only the very rich could afford to have water piped first through aqueducts and then typically through underground lead pipes to their private homes. Even in those villas which were connected to water pipes, the bigger the pipe, the more expensive it was, so only the richest could afford to have private baths. This meant that the communal baths played an important part in daily life. The Romans were not the first culture to use communal baths. It is thought that early Egyptian palaces had communal baths. And baths, of course, were certainly central to the ancient Greeks. The baths in the Palace of Knossos, for example, date back to 1700 BC. Types of baths. Although wealthy Romans might set up a bath in their townhouses, or especially in their country villas, heating a series of rooms or even a separate building especially for this purpose, even they often frequented the numerous public bathhouses in the cities and towns throughout the empire. These small bathhouses were called balnea. These were originally created as a functional tool for getting clean after physical training. However, they evolved over time. The name, of course, came from the Greek and came to be used as well for private baths in the villas of the very rich. Whilst these balnea might be privately owned, they were sometimes public in the sense that they could be open to the people for a fee, which was usually quite reasonable. Larger baths, the more public baths, were called thermi and were owned by the state and often covered several city blocks. These baths were more about pleasure as much as cleansing. The emperor was often involved in funding these state baths and generally kept entrance fees to a minimum to increase his popularity. These baths could be hugely ornate buildings with rich furnishings, high vaulted ceilings, brightly coloured mosaics, paintings, marble panels and silver faucets and fittings. They were often commissioned of course to show off the Emperor's power and they became luxurious social and recreation centres including many different things aside from the baths themselves such as gymnasia, libraries, reading rooms, gardens, art galleries, covered walks terraces and shops.
is a reconstruction of the baths of Agrippa, a famous Roman statesman from 25 BC. Here's a reconstruction of the baths of Caracalla. This is from the 3rd century AD, which is a much later example from than the time that we're studying, the 1st century AD. However, you can get an idea of how ornate and beautiful and large these thermi were. Bees, times and women. Entry was not free to the baths, but it was very cheap and it could be subsidised by politicians in their desire to seek popularity for elections or subsidised by the emperor himself. The low cost meant that people of all social classes could afford to and did go daily. These fees were within the budget of most free Roman males and women. Since the Roman workday began at sunrise, work was usually over at a little after noon. So at about 2 to 3 p.m., men would go to the baths and plan to stay for several hours of sport, bathing and conversation, after which they would be ready for a relaxing dinner. But what about women? Bathhouses during the Republic, Republican time often had separate bathing facilities for women and men. But by the time of the emperors, and by the time of the first century AD, the custom was to open the bathhouses to women during the early part of the day and reserve it for men from 2 p.m. until closing time. Closing time was usually sundown although we occasionally hear of a bath being used at night. Uh, one story we hear of about the baths was a, regarding a contract for the management of a provincial bath, which specified that the facility would be open to women from daybreak until about noon, and then to men from 2pm until sunset, although the women got the less desirable hours and their fee was twice as high as their men's. One as a copper coin for a woman, whilst only half an as for a man. Mixed bathing was generally frowned upon, although the fact that various emperors repeatedly forbade it seems to indicate that the prohibitions did not always work. This plan of the foreign baths in Pompeii shows the area for men in blue and the area for women in red or a pink. You can see there is quite a difference. The green area is the area for the furnaces. Now I'm going to talk you through a typical visit to the baths. Bathers would enter the bath complex into an atrium. They could exercise here, potentially, and slaves might wait in this area. It was also here that they would pay the admission fee for the keeper of the baths. At this point, bathers did not always proceed directly to the main baths. They might choose to then go on to the palaestra. This was a large open air area surrounded by colonnades in which they could have a pleasant stroll. In the palaestra, men would undertake light and relaxed exercise. This would include traditional Roman pursuits such as wrestling, ball games and fencing with wooden swords, as well as weightlifting with barbells. This area was as much a chance to meet friends for a chat and a friendly game and to prepare the body for the bathing that followed as it was to undertake physical exercise. After this, they would head to the apoditarium. This was the changing room. Here, the bather would get undressed and place his clothes in niches on the wall for storage whilst he went and bathed. 
reasonably well-off bathers would be accompanied by one or more slaves to assist them in bathing by carrying towels and oils, as well as carrying out more personal activities, such as massage and even hair removal. This is the apodeterium from the Forum Baths in Pompeii, which shows the storage areas clearly. The arched ceiling would allow condensation to trickle down the sides instead of on the heads of the bathers. These rooms often contained a hole in the roof to let the light flood in. You can see traces of the elaborate plaster work on the ceiling. The bather here would probably also have paid a fee to a slave so that the slave could stand guard over his clothes as this seems to have been a common problem. Rich bathers would have a slave, however, whose job it was to stand in the changing room to guard clothes. Often the apoditerium would be beautifully decorated. This example is from the central baths in Herculaneum. And uh, this is a mosaic of the god Triton together with sea creatures. This is a common emblem in the baths. Following this, bathers would go to the tepidarium, or the warm room. Here the bather would perspire gently while sitting in pleasant temperatures, which were created by heated floors and walls, although there was no bath in this room. The function of this room was to prepare the body for the hotter temperatures to come in the next room. Some establishments might combine the apoditerium with the tepidarium in one room. The next room a bather would visit was the caldarium, or the hot room. The floor of this room got so hot that bathers would have to wear sandals on their feet to stop them getting burned, and the room would always be steamy, much like a modern sauna today. This room was always the room next to the furnace, so that it could create maximum heat, with the warm room and the cold room being progressively further away. It was also in this room that the bather would be cleaned, although this process could often happen in changing room. In this room in the, would be several marble benches on which the babe, bather would lie after his bath. A masseur, who was either a personal slave or a slave employed by the baths, would rub olive oil, the Romans did not have soap, into the skin and scrape it off with a blunt metal scraper called a strigil. This would remove the dirt sweat and impurities from the skin and was a vital part of the whole bathing process. Whilst in this room, as in many parts of the bath, bathers could buy a snack from various food sellers who touted for business there. At one end of the caldera room would also be a large communal bath. Bathers could wallow and relax in this but would not get cleaned in it. Romans would bathe naked at all stages and clearly had a very different attitude to their bodies from us in this respect. They were also unconcerned with hygiene as they had no knowledge of the causes of diseases or the spread of germs. Following this, they would go to the Brigadarium, which is the cold plunge pool. Here the bather would sit briefly in the cold plunge pool, and this had the effect of closing up the pores and stopping the bather from sweating after the heat of the previous room. Other bathing facilities might include swimming pools, such as the one on the left here from Pompeii, dry steam rooms, which are like modern saunas, or separate massage rooms and communal toilets, such as the ones on the right. The largest baths might even contain separate rooms for gymnastics and the removal of dust after taking exercise. <laughs>